So I've been told that um, because I'm in Canada and everyone's so nice uh, and polite, as all the shirts said in the root store I went to yesterday, uh, that I should warn you that I might cuss. Um, I'm trying really, 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 really hard not to cuss because my wife, whose parents are Canadian, um, I don't know that they always watch my speeches because maybe the cussing's too much. Uh, and my dad keeps telling me my grandmother can't stand it. So hopefully I won't cuss, but warning, I might. Uh, I'm Tamika. That's my Twitter handle and my organization's Twitter handle. I think because my wife is Canadian, many of my coworkers think I'm just here on vacation. So if you could just tweet a few times of me speaking in a suit, that would be really great. And so, <laughs> thanks, Ken. Check. So a lot of people, especially when I, I come to transportation conferences and they hear my bio, they're like, wait, who are you? Why, why are you here? You're not an engineer. You're not an urban planner. True and true. Um, so, you know, my background is that I was, I spent most of my time growing up in Okinawa, Japan. Has anyone ever been to Okinawa, Japan? Yes. This side of the room is my favorite, and then the one person over there. <laughs> and so, Okinawa, Japan is a beautiful island, um, very similar to like Hawaii and, um, and climate. And I grew up there because my dad was in the military and um, he worked at Kadena Air Base, which is uh, near the south of the map. Uh, and I grew up kind of across from that um, at McTourist um, Base. And so in Okinawa, Japan, I really grew from second grade until right before I started high school as someone who knew my identity largely is just being American. So when you live on a military base, everyone treats us the same because we're all American. And in Okinawa in particular, there's this horrible history of every few years, an American you know, military young guy will rape a Japanese schoolgirl, then the base will go on lockdown, and we're not allowed to leave the base, and especially young girls. And I never felt like when I was in a store or when I was out you know, in the community, people were watching me because I was black. People were watching me because I was American. No matter what our parents' rank was, like for us kids, it felt like our parents all had the same job. It felt like we all had the same amount of money. There was only one toy store on base, and there was only one clothing store on base. So we literally all wore the same things. We all had the same shoes. We all had the same toys. And so it never felt like your identity was based on anything else except for being American. And then one day, my dad came home and he said, we're moving back to the States. Where do you want to go? And my older sister and I said, we want to go to California. We want to go to Hawaii. We want to go to Florida. And he said, we're going to Nebraska. <laughs> and so I don't know how many people have ever been to Nebraska. Yeah, people aren't like proudly raising their hand. <laughs> When I'm like, who's been to Okinawa? People are like, oh my gosh, yes, I love it. When I'm like, who's been to Nebraska? People are like, I don't know. <laughs> so Nebraska is not California, Hawaii, or Florida. Um, but it is where my parents grew up. Uh, my dad had 14 brothers and sisters. They all lived in Nebraska. And my dad's job, which I don't know a lot about because he did intelligence in the military. That's all he ever really could tell us. There's a secure facility in Nebraska that's like an underground bunker. And he was specially requested to be there based on his secu security clearance. And so we moved back to Nebraska. And so for folks who don't know what Nebraska really is, it's a lot of corn. A really, really lot of corn. When you Google Nebraska, pictures of corn just keep coming up. Just keep coming up. And then white people. White people and corn. <laughs> that's all we have. The white people sometimes walk in the corn. It's, it's a lot. And so I ended up going to college in Nebraska as well. This is a picture of the church on, on my university, um, Creighton University. So I went to a Catholic school. And let me tell you, being gay and black at a Catholic school in Nebraska is a lot of fun. <laughs> There's so many people who are just like you. You just, you blend in seamlessly. 
and so after I, I left, um, you know, after I left university, I had gotten good grades. I had done relatively well for myself. And so my parents, who had worked really hard uh, to make sure my sister and I had better lives than they did, um, said, you have to be a doctor or a lawyer. You have to go get a profession. I don't think I knew what engineers or urban planners did. I don't even think I knew what like professors did or how you became a professor. I knew that if I was going to be successful, I had to be a lawyer or a doctor. So knowing that, I realized that I hate blood makes me want to pass out. And med school seems really long. Law school was three years. So I thought, I'm going to go to law school. And not only am I going to go to law school, because I'm black and gay and I'm not at all Midwestern, I have to go out to a coast. And so the best place to go is San Francisco. Because who doesn't want to be gay in San Francisco? <laughs> and so I applied to a ton of law schools. And ultimately, I got into Stanford. And I was so excited. So I don't know how many people have been to San Francisco and then how many people have been to Stanford. They're not the same place. <laughs> They're not the same place at all. Palo Alto is not the gay mecca you want it to be. It is the mecca of technology and nerds. That is it. We, we called Stanford Nerdland because we were all nerds. And when I went to Stanford, this was literally the number of black kids in my law school class. And my wife was looking at this other day, and she's like, who's that one guy? I don't know him. I know all the black people you went to law school with, because there's that few. And we talk to each other all the time. And so after I graduated from law school, I stayed in San Francisco, and I became an employment lawyer. And I became an employment lawyer that was focused on giving you know, access to jobs and helping with employment discrimination, and particularly focused on the black community. Because as the black gay Midwesterner who had to leave the Midwest because there weren't enough black gay people, when I got to San Francisco after I graduated to start my law career, I realized there aren't any black people in San Francisco either. It was like being in Calgary. Like I've barely seen any black people since I've been here. I'm just like, where, where is everybody? We went to get ice cream at Village Ice Cream last night. And I was like, oh, there's three. They're all getting in the same car. <laughs> like, and that's what it was like being in San Francisco. So many black people had been displaced from the core of the city. And they were pushed to this area called Bayview. And my first real experience doing transportation work was when I tried to open up my employment law clinic in Bayview. And no one in Bayview wanted to talk to me about just their employment discrimination issues because they couldn't even get jobs, because there was no public transportation access out to the neighborhood they had been pushed to. And so before anybody would trust me to be their lawyer, because I didn't look like a lawyer, I mean, I wore you know, baseball caps when everybody else was wearing graduation caps. Like, I, I just didn't look what they thought a lawyer would be. But before they would trust me, they wanted to know what I thought about transportation. They wanted to know what I thought about getting them from their isolated part of the city to the core of the city where there were jobs. And they wanted to know what I thought about, about the fact that the city was building an LRT line, but hadn't talked to anybody in the community about what they needed, or about when they needed it, or where the stops would make sense. So you know, I did that for a few years. And I was like, who wants to be a lawyer? This is boring. And I mean, my wife's a lawyer, so. You know, and she allows me to, to do this work because she makes more money than you get paid at a bike coalition. So, you know, I, I eventually made my way back to transportation when I met her. So I met her and I was living in San Francisco and she is from a, a long line of Canadians from the East Coast and her parents who were born in Montreal and grew up in, in uh, Toronto and met in planning school. Um, they left Toronto because of the gray weather and they moved to Phoenix. They're like, we need sun. So they moved to Arizona in the States, and that's where she was born. And so she lived in LA when I met her and when we started dating. And San Francisco was too gray for her, even though San Francisco is beautiful. So I moved down to LA, and that's uh, you know, where we got married and where I rediscovered the way in which transportation is so key to every other issue in the community. I did a little bit of public health work. I did a little bit of work around boys and men of color. But what I kept coming back to was people couldn't get to a doctor if there was no transportation. 
young men of color who are more often in elementary school, tagged as problem children, tagged as rambunctious, and then get sent into what we call the school to prison pipeline. They're often sent in that school to prison pipeline when they show up late for school, for truancy. So they get to school and they get to school late and they get a ticket. And after so many tickets, you get kicked out of school. When you get kicked out of school, you end up doing things to get by and you end up in the criminal justice system. So when you talk to these young boys about why they're late to school, it's because they live in neighborhoods without reliable public transportation options. Their parents are working two jobs. They're supposed to get on the bus. They're supposed to get to school. But in black communities and brown communities and low income communities, the bus doesn't show up on time or it doesn't come at all. And so by the time they finally get to school, they're getting a ticket and no one's asking them why. And so I you know, decided I'm gonna get back into the transportation world. And so that's where we are today and why I wanna talk about transportation work is anti-oppression work. And so right now, if you're anything like my wife, you're probably like, wait, what? You're gonna talk about oppression? I thought we were talking about resiliency and infrastructure and engineering, but remember, I'm not an engineer, so I just talk about what I know, and I don't know a lot about engineering. So, yes, we're gonna talk about oppression. And sometimes people are like, why is the Bike Coalition person talking about oppression work, right? Because bikes make everybody happy. They, well, except for when you try to put a bike lane. But other than that, Bikes make everybody happy. When you're on your bike, you're smiling, you're with your family, you're making connections. And anybody who's ever been on a bike before knows that it's like when you're a kid and you have that sense of freedom. And for the first time, you can get on your bike and your parents literally let go and you're just on your own and you feel the wind in your hair and that's the feeling that bikes give you. And that's why I love my job. But I also feel like I have to talk about oppression because oppression is always just around the corner. So sometimes, as planners or engineers, we like to talk about infrastructure. And we like to talk about our plans. And we like to talk about what's gonna make people safer. And we like to do all of that without ever talking about oppression. But if you don't talk about oppression and you don't understand the history of oppression, on people who have been historically neglected by planning, then you're not gonna do your best work. And in the United States, we're thinking about this a lot these days <laughs> because we had a really great president and now we have another guy <laughs> who some people call a president, some of us don't. And so, you know, we're thinking about all the ways in which certain communities are continuing to be disenfranchised. And it's not just in the United States, right? We've seen this all over the world where there's leaders who are running on platforms of excluding certain people. And oftentimes when we go to those conversations, we think about immigration policies and we think about things that seem really high level, but when we exclude people, when we keep people out, it's also in the way we build communities. And it's also in the way we do our work. And so we have to think about these things. And so first, it's really important to understand what oppression is, right? So at its most basic level, it's just unjust or cruel exercise of authority or power. So if you have power or if you have authority, it's using it in a way that is unjust. But then there's institutional race, or oppression. And this is the one that I think is most important for those of us who work in professions where we're part of bigger systems, right? Because this is when you systematically mistreat people who are in a certain group, and then you support that mistreatment by established things like customs, our laws, our practices. And so, you know, maybe in the States, an example we always use is sometimes universities will admit people who have like a legacy. So people in their family have gone to that school, right? We see it all the time in schools, we see it all the time in jobs. If you know somebody, that's how you get in. And even though we might not think of it as oppression, it is. Because we have to think about why certain people don't have anybody already in the system. I don't have any lawyers in my family. I certainly didn't have anybody who had been admitted to Stanford Law School or Harvard Law School like me. And so if, if there's just these practices in place, 
are they oppressing people? If we have on our job applications that you have to check a box if you've had a criminal history, but then you look at the data, and by the stats, more people of color have been in the criminal justice system, then whether or not we mean to, we're systematically oppressing a group of people. And sometimes it's overt. Sometimes the people who are being oppressed know. So if you have a sign that says no blacks, I know. I know what you're doing, <laughs> right? We all know. I mean, if you have you know, a sign that says make America great, then it might be a little bit more covert. It might be a little bit more hidden, right? And when you have covert types of oppression, the people who are the victims of it often second guess themselves. And so as women in any profession, but especially you know, this profession, we know what I'm talking about, right? When someone's constantly talking over you or constantly interrupting you, are there just systems put in place where it seems like women are never getting ahead? As women, what do we always do? We say, well, maybe I should have tried harder. Well, maybe, maybe I said something wrong. Maybe the point I made that the dude just repeated and everyone thought was amazing is because I didn't clearly articulate it, right? But that's because the oppression's covert and we're, we're kind of questioning ourselves. So you have to, if you wanna talk about doing this work, you have to be okay knowing what oppression means and trying to fight against it. And why does this matter for people who do our kind of work? So how many people have seen this picture before? So some of you have and some of you haven't. So this is a man in New York who is standing on the sidewalk. He always stood on the sidewalk. He illegally sold some cigarettes when he would stand on that sidewalk. But he was mainly just a character in the community. Everyone knew him. He lived in New York. He has kids. He has a partner. And the police tried to arrest him for standing on the sidewalk. And they put him in a chokehold. And you can hear him saying several times, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And they killed him. Now, as a black person in America, this isn't surprising to me. Because black people are dying all the time, right? At the hands of police officers. Now, a lot of people think, man, this is about police reform. In the states, they have to reform their criminal justice system so stuff like this doesn't happen. And as somebody who's involved in built communities and built environment, I think this is our problem too. Because this is a community without a lot of green space. This is a community where when this guy and his friends want to hang out and talk and just catch up with each other, there's no place to go. There's no place to stand. And so they do it on the sidewalk. And so maybe we should reform our police system, which we should in the States. But also, as people who plan communities, we have to think about what makes a community? And where can community members own public space so they can be themselves and so they can just breathe? This is another picture. This is a picture that's a still from video images. And the video images were taken in San Francisco by kids on a bus, on a public bus. And so again, this man was shot by police officers and died. And there's a theme, black people in the United States are dying, right? And again, this is another problem for police reform. But when you look at this, is it really just a police reform problem? If kids and community members can't ride on the public bus and can't be somewhere by a bus stop just waiting for a bus without feeling in danger or without feeling like something's gonna happen to them, how do we think about that in our work? This is Oscar Grant, somebody else from the Bay Area. He was pulled out of the BART rail, you know, our regional transit, and he was shot by an officer who was doing enforcement on transit. And so again, is this a reform problem for our enforcement agencies? Or do we have to think about the fact that there are certain people who are using our systems of transportation who are using public space and don't feel safe. 
and they don't feel safe just because of who they are. Because we haven't thought about how we plan. We haven't thought about how we talk to people. We haven't thought about why certain people in certain communities can't afford our fares. We haven't thought about all the ways in which oppression fits into this work. And if we aren't thinking about this, then how do we do our best work? If we aren't thinking about this, what are we doing to make people feel safe? This little girl didn't feel safe. She's not even a teenager. She was riding her bike in a community where there was no infrastructure. Not in a city where there was no infrastructure, in a community where there was no infrastructure. Because we know that often low-income communities or communities of color are historically neglected and don't get infrastructure. So she was riding her bike in the street and she was hit by a car. And when the police came to investigate the scene, they blamed her. And we know people who bike often get blamed. And not only that, they didn't question the infrastructure. They didn't question the investments. They put her in the back of a cop car and they maced her while she screamed. Now, in the States, that would never happen to a blonde white girl with blue eyes. It just wouldn't. And the chances are, she might not be riding her bike in a neighborhood where there wasn't more infrastructure. And so again, we can condemn the police officers, which we do all the time. Not that it works. They never get convicted. We keep dying. But for those of us in this field who say we want to do something, but we just can't because it's not our area of work, you can do something. You can think about where you're making your investments, how you're making your investments. Are you talking to community members? Are you understanding that for them, they might not want to talk about a fucking bike lane until they know that you have thought about other issues in their community, why they don't have access to food, why they don't have access to green space, why they don't have street lights that work or buses that come on time. So sometimes, as folks who do this work, we come into a community and we say, man, people keep getting hit when they cross the street. I know, I'll put a crosswalk at the intersection. And then people keep crossing the street in the middle of the street, right? And you have this idea that we put in the crosswalk, that should work, but you've never talked to the people in community who would tell you that where they're crossing from is where there's a big tree that offers shade for all the old ladies in the community who have to take the bus. And so those old ladies stand under the tree. And then when the bus comes, they run across and get the bus. And so you put in a crosswalk at the intersection, which they'll still never go to, but you could have just put in a sun shelter by the bus stop, right? And why are these little old ladies standing over here? Why don't they just wait for the bus when we have an app that says when the bus is gonna come? Does everybody have the same access to technology? Does the bus come on time in their community? If we're not asking all of these questions and examining the micro ways that oppression plays into our work, then again, are we doing our best work?